and actually a few, few interesting young people are going to be part of this uh, exhibition. Uh, ben Nelson, David Nelson, Alex uh, Baskenstein, um, uh, Ripple Fang, Britt uh, Ruggiello, William Shields, um, Ben Gillian, uh and Coley Mixon, among other people. Uh, that's happening at the same time as uh, the art fair and also the other side. So it's a bunch of new young artists that worth checking out at this space parallel to this other events. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is um, th those of you who have intended to this might not work before, if you like us, go to the website and sign up for your uh, email invitations. If you hate us, say something <laughs> or start your own organization. <laughs> that would probably be the best thing. <laughs> the, the reason that we did this was because we thought there might be a need for independent uh, movements like this. Um, Matt and I started it, but Matt is out traveling the world for the past 10 months. <laughs> and I've been doing it for myself. <laughs> so I'm really happy to be taking you off too. <laughs> so, so from now on, it's everybody else. Um, <laughs> Every man for himself. Huh? Every man for himself. For himself. Um, yeah. So the other the other cool thing that I want to mention is um, uh, tomorrow next day is a um, is a really informal coffee meeting at uh, Cafe Vita uh, as part of the Red May, which uh, Philip Olsen there is organizing, and he's in the back. You can talk to him after the talk, and um, he has a bunch of cool uh, things lined up for Seattle, which I'm really interested. Uh, I'm probably going to come back uh, in, in, in 2017 for those, and there's a bunch of really interesting uh, events that are going to happen in Seattle during the May 2017, which is worth checking out. Um, so those of you who are interested, go to Cafe Vita at 6.30 tomorrow. Um, other than that, I think that was all. Um, this is all the announcement and stuff. Um, I don't want to talk too much, so without further ado. Without further ado. Yeah. Cheers to Gary Hill. Okay. I have to use a microphone. Because I, I just have to have that something in front of me while I speak. Um, I decided not to have any images because I thought it would be too hot given the heat that we already have. Just how we tend to hang our hat on images and kind of stick to them and they get very sticky. So I thought I'd just do something different for myself too and <clears throat> just uh, recite texts from various works from probably before 1980 to around now or a little while ago or something like that. Um, I will try not to contextualize too much, just let them be what they are, but in some cases it's sort of interesting uh, where they reside. Um, so, uh, the first one doesn't have to really be the first one, I just, it's at the top of the pile. Um, this is uh, from a work called And Sat Down Beside Her. And, uh, I'm going to just turn down the treble here a little bit. At least in my ears, it seems a little harsh. So let me know if it kind of gets a little more availability for you. Okay? <laughs> um, yeah, that sounds a little better, actually, for me. Um, is that okay out there? Yep. Not too loud, not too soft, just kind of... Because so, it's only voice now, so I just want to make sure that everything is good. Good, and we can get inside that voice. So, um, anyway, this is uh, was a little text, uh, part of a uh, three pieces that were, or I, sh I should say, three elements that were part of the work. Uh, that is about spiders. Um, it kind of refers to the nursery rhyme, but not in any particular way. But it's definitely about spiders. And this was a, uh, projected on the floor um, with a projection. Uh, I mean, it was written on the floor with a projection of a 
um, typewriter, IBM typewriter ball on top of it. So it's also, uh, I promise not to do this for everyone, I just thought, since this is the first one, <laughs> just a little delay is always nice, right? Uh, this is, it, it, it's definitely about writing. Uh, it's about, or at least then, um, or at least I think it is, because I'm not really a writer. I mean, I just, uh, it seemed to be about what a writer would go through if they were typing on an IBM typewriter. Because an IBM typewriter, you know, before there were computers and stuff, uh, there's a ball that sits there in front of the text. So every time you hit it, it's, it's kind of interrupting your view of what you're writing. And I always thought that was you know, a little disruptive for the mind uh, in the connection to the words. So that's what this little tiny little text is about. So here we go. After I you know, wet my mouth. This has always been it. A bewildering object in my path, collecting more and more of whatever collecting tends to collect. When nothing clicks. When things just couple, becoming twos instead of ones. And then it stops. Stops dead in its tracks. Backlogs. Rolls back on one of its many convoluted surfaces and sits there, perfecting stillness. My gaze thickens before a black spherical object laden with dull silvery characters, symbols and numbers that now and then jolts forth and back each time to rotate its discrete distance. The movement is quick, animated, like certain walking arachnids. Um, so this is a little longer of a text. It's called Around and About, and um, interestingly enough, I typically, when I do show images, moving images, videos, I, I many times start with this text because it's very direct uh, to the audience. There's a kind of assumption, assumptions going on both ways, and it's kind of dealing with that. But it's also the, at least the second work, but the most um, uh, elaborated work that I did having to do with editing images to, to a text whereby each image changes with each syllable spoken. So we have the sense that the images are being driven by speech, by voice, by the body. And without that, there would be no images. I find that actually true, actually, but anyway. So I'll, I'll go ahead with that now. I'm sure it could have gone another way, a completely different way, a way that has never come to mind, but that's a given. One can never observe all the possibilities and still go on to the next. Sometimes one just exits and enters again. I think I, I can agree with myself that it's not a matter of choice. You might think that a green is a kind of choice, even a blatant choice, but that's not all you're interested in either. There's another determining factor, and that's what we have to concentrate on. At least I do. I agree, it's easy to get sidetracked. It's not even that there's a lot going on. We're just busy. I mean, it's not complicated. You can go on, I can go on. We can assume there's something happening, or not something happening. I don't know. Perhaps it's unfair to go on. Maybe we should take our minds off it. Think about something else. Maybe it's not worth thinking about at all. But that leads to other things just as problematic. Maybe it should be more complicated. We're looking at it too simply. Look, we don't have to consider all the possibilities, but instead really complicate one if that's what you want to do. I don't know. Maybe it's my fault. I came unprepared. I'm not ready to be complex. I don't think that's the answer, though. I don't think it's an answer we're looking for. In certain ways, that's probably obvious by now. 
even knowing that you're a little uneasy with it on IM2. But I think it's a way I can work with now, and maybe you can, and maybe you can't. I mean, I'm thinking about that. There's time involved here, and it's yours as much as mine. I certainly don't want to threaten your time or make you feel you have to be decisive. Yet, I want you to be here. I mean, I assume you are here, but I don't want to back you into a corner. And by the same token, I don't want to start from that corner. That's a particular relationship I would like to put aside for now. I know this isn't free of bullshit. I mean, I'm coming from somewhat of a self-conscious place. It's a kind of stacking. I mean, the ideas just pile up but aren't interwoven. They're not connected or disconnected. It's a thought, at least. I can see it. Disembodied ideas being thrown against the wall. But this isn't fair. This isn't fair for me or you. That really kind of loads things down, and that's not my intention. I can assure you of that. I want you to be with me. I want I mean, you don't have to listen, just hear me out. I don't want you to be involved in deciphering anything, but then that's your prerogative, and I don't want to get in your way. There's something that can be said for that, and I hear you, but I don't want to listen to it. I realize it's easy for one to say that I'm being ambiguous, but I don't think so. I mean, if you want to leave, you can do that, or you can just turn off. I'm not trying to say I'm indifferent. I just think there's a way here. Maybe you really do hear me, and I'm going on and on, but we have to continue for some time. I mean, I think that's part of it. It would be easy to stop at this point. It would be just interesting over and possibly boring. But that isn't even the issue. It's important that we go on. This is the way I think it has to be right now. If it wasn't this, it would be that. And there's still this area we have to get through so that the this and the that won't become significant to this. I mean, what I am talking about isn't important in that way that importance draws attention. You might even think this is a game of some sort, but really, you've tried ways that were adjacent to this one when you weren't thinking about the consequences. You may even have heard this before in so many words, but I want to go on. I'm not interested in this kind of talking. It has its purpose, but it can get very sticky. I would rather settle with you some way that's non-reversible, a way of being with you when it's the only way. When I arrived here, I had no way of knowing it would be this way. I thought about it a lot in the beginning. I tried different ways of thinking of you and what your response would be. And that has to be considered now, too. I've never lost sight of that. I don't think there's been a loss of anything. It's just that I haven't been accumulating things for me or you. There's always time for a sense of urgency. I want to avoid that for now. I don't know, though. Maybe you're waiting for that, waiting and listening. I forget if I, that's called a round and about. It's from 1980. So this is uh, a spoken text for a, a work I did called Glasses, uh, which was part of a series called Core Series that has to do with two images that are um, switching at frame rates back and forth, so it's kind of very kinetic. And the two images basically um, in this case, you're just seeing a room uh, and, and the two images make a panoramic view of that room. So you see the two images look like as if they go together. So as they change directions, the images have to swap, but they continue to uh, vibrate between the two sides. The text really won't sound like it has anything to do with that, and that's why it's probably like this anyway. It's, it's kind of derived from that kind of, uh, I don't know, nursery school kind of thing. So, one, two, buckle my shoe. Three, four, shut the door. Five, six, pick up sticks. Seven, eight, 
don't be late. Nine, ten, mother hen, someone's got a phone. <laughs> One, two, nothing new. Three, four, wild boar. Five, six, little fix. Seven, eight, that's great. Nine, ten, not again. One, two, yellow glue. Three, four, there is more. Five, six, drink this. Seven, eight, kind of rape. Nine, ten, big Ben. One, two, black and blue. Three, four, rotten core. Five, six, missing bricks. Seven, eight, black bait. Nine, ten, bad men. One, two, me, you. Three, four, want more. Five, six, table of pricks. Seven, eight, double saint. Nine, ten, empty death. One, two, coming soon. Three, four, changing the sore. Five, six, lost mix. Seven, eight, Fuck Jake. Nine, ten, loose end. One, two, don't move. Three, four, be a whore. Five, six, nothing clicks. Seven, eight, God's fate. Nine, ten, word blend. So it's from a work called Videograms, and uh, they're kind of little some things. There's probably some word for it in literary language. I don't know what it is, but anyway, uh, they describe happenings, and um, they were probably meant. Um, well, I'm sure they were meant. Um, or, or at least in the back of my mind, when they were written uh, for this particular machine that I used to make images, which is called a red extra synthesizer. Um, but it allows you to kind of manipulate things in a very electric, organic, real-time way. Um, but it's too difficult to describe or explain or anything, and it really doesn't matter. So. I'll just read you some of them. Um, and they're, they're numbered, and uh, they were numbered intuitively, kind of having to do with, uh, you know, what they looked like, or something in them, or, I don't know, if I, if I numbered them today, I would probably number them differently, so I don't really have much to say about intuition, frankly. but. So this was number six then. <laughs> Looking through a hole, cut to be looked through, the pedestrian waited for the light to change. A construction crew was working on a foundation. Brown backs, concrete blocks, precision instruments for leveling performed in a dirt amphitheater. Every so often, two men would act as two nodes. Between them, a long yellow piece of metal with numbers and lines on it told them how far apart they were. One node would always let go, causing the metal to suck itself up into a tight spiral. The workers moved from location to location, repeating their ritual again and again. Uh, this is number 27. Light passed through the window as it is able to do. It had that gold orange color that happened. It sprawled over the things in the room. A fixed gaze moved among the reflections caused by the wall of glass, separating vision from pure light. A trapezoidal shape was framed by the refrigerator door. The pupils closed for a moment as the reflection glared on the chrome handle. The geometry could not keep its degrees of angle or of heat as it moved to the adjacent wall. 
It rounded the corner, moving exponentially slower, blurring and growing dim, fading to the ambience of the hallway. This is uh, number 33. Asked to kiss, couldn't engage. To open mouth was a decision too overbearing for the moment. The lips, an amphibian, directed by evolution to live on the face. Each kiss slicing its belly open, gutting it, exposing an internal network where the guts of a partner's amphibian are devoured. <laughs> See, there's anything else here. Oh, this is kind of strange. So this is number 24. About this room, it's too oblong. Mm -hmm. There's too much strain on peripheral vision. The alternative is the living room where the stereo headphones are attached. One can sit in the chair and rock through thereness or exit altogether, move closer to the freeway, contract a private ramp for immediate access. God only knows why they came up with that. <laughs> anyway, a lot of these, like I said, they were written sort of for this knowing kind of in the back of my mind what this machine can do. So it's very difficult to explain what that actually is. So, um, so I'm not going to, this next one, I, I won't do the whole thing. Um, uh, um, it's called Primarily Speaking. In fact, this is a text that could kind of go on forever, so I certainly won't do that. Uh, but it's, uh, I'm just remembering now the way this was written, especially in light of today, you know, technology today, I guess. Um, it, it's made up of many somewhat idiomatic expressions, but also just very kind of, I don't know what they're called again, probably there's some term for them, but it's kind of like idi idioms, but things that you use a lot in language to connect things, or you use often, words like this, anyway, phrases like this. And uh, I collected as many as I could at the time, and I, I typed them out, you know, I had a typewriter, right? Remember from before I had a typewriter? No. But it wasn't not the end. But anyway, uh, and, I, and, I, and I actually kind of set them up almost like a, a, a cinematic around me, like a, you know, half a, circle, like six, eight pages, and I started to write, and then when I got s kind of stuck, I would just start scanning until one just kind of locked in, and then I could go further, whether they were there or not, it's just that I used that to kind of, you know, uh, push me further into, into the text. So that's kind of how it was written, and like I say, it could go on, uh, you know, forever. Um, and that is true also for the images. This was the second larger work I did where the images are edited to, either edited to the syllabic structure of the speaking and or moving through uh, outputs to that rhythm. So it's actually two walls and the, 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 the speaking kind of goes back and forth. So when one is changing its content, the other one is changing its spatial location. But both are having to do with the rhythm of the speech very particularly. Um, and in, in, in a, many times I've said that, you know, it, it, it's not like the images could be any images, but they could be many, 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 many different other images. And that is particularly true with Around and About, because I was just in an office, that was the one I read before, um, and I was doing it live, as far as the editing, I was just moving cameras and editing as I went, and there was nothing particularly interesting about 
what was in that office. It was just whatever I could find looked like an image. It's a weird thing, what looks like an image. Well, anything does if you put a frame around it, you know. So, anyway, um, so yeah, I won't do the whole thing. I promise. So, it, like I said, it kind of goes back and forth. It could really be two voices, but I'm saving that for later. So, <laughs> okay, so. Well, you know what they say. We've all heard it before. It never ceases to amaze me. This time, it's more than just a change in the weather. They've really outdone themselves. How they ever got it past us, I don't know. In many circles, it's considered the unspeakable. These types of goings-on surface every so often. Statistically, one of us is probably involved. There's always someone willing to run the risk. At this point, though, there are no telltale signs to speak of. I wonder if the better thing to do is refrain from speculation, hang in there but hold back, not get caught up in the missing link syndrome. Of course there's an ulterior motive. When is there ever not? That it's been dropped in our laps, I'm sure, is no accident. We can't just stand around, though. Where to go from here is the question. Do you have any ideas? One thing's for certain. They don't know we'll go to any length to do what has to be done. For the time being, we can hold our own. We're bound to come across something in that near future. There's no way in the world I'm going to get framed this time around. Chances are you're thinking along similar lines. Stick close to me and remember, I'll be calling the shots from now on. If at any time I drop back, you pick up where I left off. If we find ourselves losing touch, here's a little piece of advice. There can never be an eye for an eye. There will always be a middleman who will whisper in your ear at every turn something to the effect of, we can go by the book, or you can eat my words. No reason to go to such extremes. Think little or nothing of it. Then again, just to be on the safe side, better file it away for future reference. So, let's get on with the business at hand. We can cover a lot of ground in the time we've allotted ourselves. We have our choice living in suspended animation, or under the auspices of supply and demand. I've swallowed a good many hook, line, and sinker in light of the fact I've been a fish out of water for a long time. It's pretty safe to assume you're in the same position. Sure, I know that you know that I know that you know, so on and so forth. You've got it all staked out. I know you were playing for keeps from the beginning. Why do I sense a note of skepticism? Listen, we can part company anytime. In case you've forgotten, this is all at your convenience. Still, it's necessary, if not by design, that we cross paths in some way, shape, or form. Off the record, this is somewhat out of character for me, as I imagine being closed mouth is for you. If it all seems a bit too high and dry, take comfort in the fact that coming up face to face would eliminate our time for reflection. Look, on the surface, what do we have to lose? Aesthetic persuasion? Leisure time? What is it? Why has it come to this? I've never turned on you before, or vice versa. Have our shortcomings finally met? One of us must accept the other. If not, the two of us accept each other. The remaining possibility is out of the question. In light of the situation, maybe it's wrong to carry on like this. We've been on delicate ground before. Should one of us back off? Wait, let's try to be objective. There's no sense in running ourselves into a ditch. In the midst of it all, let's try to be objective for a moment. Point blank, who are you? I mean it, just this one time. We don't have to split hairs or anything. Within reason, who are you? Come on, shift gears for a minute. 
Take a deep breath. You know the ropes. You're one of those in their right mind. Take a deep breath and face the music. Start now and work backwards. Start in the middle and dream. Think it over. Rattle off a list if that's all that's left. Never mind the images. They always return. If not, new ones will replace the old ones. It's their destiny. Even those permanently lodged, sooner or later, lose their grasp. It's the nature of the beast. Where did I leave off? Did you take the plunge? What was the cutoff point? Maybe you need more lead time. There's a long way to go before hitting rock bottom. Come on, put your best foot forward. Move on it, cover some ground, get the feel of it, re-enter. You're not a backseat driver, are you? I know what you're thinking. It's not in the scheme of things that you take me for a ride. After all, I'm your monkey business. I can never really touch you. I can only leave word. Still, there's not much separating us. We're like-minded. I ask the same questions. You give the same answers. You can't teach an old dog new tricks, or can you? I don't know. You tell me. What's what? Maybe you prefer sightseeing and I'm better off leaving well enough alone. I think we're off the track. I know we're off the track. I never for one moment thought I could railroad this through. I knew it was coming. This is the diminishing return I failed to negotiate. Sad but true. Less is more. More or less. More and more of the time. Oh well, such as it is. In the meantime, let's not lose sight of the facts. They do not need reiterating. There's a time and place for everything. I hope we haven't come here under false pretenses. There are things that should be said and things that should be done. You've been around and I've been around. Double talking will get us nowhere and second guessing is a lost art. Quite simply, we are an act of faith. There's no reason we can't walk out of this together. Face facts. The controlling factors of our little mise-en-scene are untouchable. Take my word for it. Put me above suspicion for a moment. Accept it. You are on the receiving end. The distances we imagine are next to close by, at arm's length, easily penetrable. We are at each other's disposal. We can concentrate on our discrepancies, or we can split the difference. That which takes the edge off. In any event, it is on our consciousness. The fixation moves from left to right. As time goes on, it becomes clockwork. You will have your way, and I will make do. In the end, we can double back or play the field. I don't want to deny you your own flesh and blood. Who am I but a figure of speech, freestanding in advance of a broken arm? These things can happen when one gets ahead of themselves. I'm just going to sit tight, take refuge in the picturesque. Things travel fast by word of mouth. I can be long-winded at times as well as drag my feet. The logical conclusion? I'm always putting my foot in my mouth. Of course you understand. This is all in a manner of speaking. I don't want to underscore my place here. That would be misleading. After all, it's not an open door policy. By the same token, it's very touch and go here. Anything can happen at any time and no one's privy to that information. I don't want to make a production out of it though. All I want is to walk through it with you. We don't have to go to the four corners of the earth to discover we speak the same language. Savvy, the place is here. The time is now, zero hour, and so on. That's not the end. <laughs> I want to come to terms with where we began and let the rest fall into place. Granted, there are many simultaneities, that goes without saying, but for practical purposes, we should respect our limits. So, take a good, long, hard look at yourself. Never mind me. I'll just go in one ear and out the other. Complications can arise in the simplest of forms and should be played out. Watch it. 
Perhaps the most we can do is to try and remain true to form. However short-lived these moments may be, we can never return to the killer instinct. Listen, the floor has been mine now for longer than I care to remember. Do you want to talk? Do you want to talk it over? Do you want to talk about it, feed it intravenously, and have it be over with as soon as possible? I know the position you're in. If you can pull it off, more power to you. It's never clear cut and you'd be wasting your time with the clean break idea. I'll bend over backwards to meet you halfway. In view of where you stand, where does that put me? Where does that leave us? In the mercenary position? Perpendicular, your right side up? No. We can't go by rote memory. There's nothing tying you down and there's nothing letting you go. Make up your mind. Get a grip on things. Your modus operandi. Square off and break ground. On the level, perhaps I'm not coming across. I know it's difficult in these close quarters. I've tried to make it as easy as possible. I assure you, one can adapt to this neck of the woods. I'm not out of bounds. You know it, and I know it. I'm not going to walk off with it, and you're not going to let it get away. When I'm through, you are going to know what I am talking about word for word. Let's face it. We are too few and far between to let generalities get the best of us. Up to this point, when all is said and done, so far, so good. When it gets down to the wire, perhaps it will be a different story. Again, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We're bound to end up in the red that way. You might think that the grass is greener on the other side, but it's once in a blue moon a situation the likes of this can occur. In all seriousness, you're dead center in the sightlines of a tour de force, etc., etc., etc. I got through that. Ooh, interesting. So, this is uh, from a work called 23595929, The Storyteller's Room. And uh, this actually, which I'll probably read too, came out of a work called Midnight Crossing, in which the title itself is very much related to 29, 23, 59, 59, 29. Um, at a certain time when one had to make laser discs for installations or what have you, when you got a... Um, a laser disc made, you had to have very particular um, uh, formatting done for the videotape that you gave them. And one of the things was that the time code, um, those are the little numbers that go with the frames of video, could not pass, could not have a midnight crossing. And this is when it goes from 23, 59, 59, 29 to 24, which really does not exist. It just goes back to one. So there's, it's like no man's land. And I always really like that they refer to it as a midnight crossing. Because it, I don't know, it just has a certain association for me, I guess, of people escaping a country or something like this surrounding <laughs> right now. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Um, but anyway, uh, so the storyteller's room was just kind of continuing that, and both these works take place in uh, more or less completely blacked out spaces that have um, low level projections that are actually from uh, uh, CRT small monitors that have lenses put on them. So. If you walked into a normal room, you wouldn't even see images. And even in a kind of a dark room, you probably wouldn't see images. And these are very large images. In this case, I mean, not 10 to 15 feet, but you're talking about a little monitor with a lens on it. And so anyway, but very quickly you realize that it's all relative. And if it's dark enough and over time, you, you forget about how light or dark the image is. It's simply you are with the image and it is what it is and there you are. Um, so anyway, in this case, 
this, this was done, uh, uh, I was a resident at a place called Cap Street in San Francisco that no longer li exists. In fact, this was the last work they did. And it's kind of, it was sort of interesting because given that fact, um, I had recorded uh, with three cameras a kind of pseudo panorama and then three more three more and like all, all around kind of on the outskirts of San Francisco in these strange neighborhoods. And in fact, one that I was recording, the police came up to me and said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm recording. <laughs> and he said, well, this neighborhood, I'm just going to stay here with you until you're done. Because <laughs> it's not a good place for you to be. <laughs> so I didn't really see what he was talking about, but okay, fine, stay. You know. Um, so anyway, uh, what happens is that these images, you have a kind of pseudo continuous panorama. And uh, there are strobe lights that are triggered, or they're not really triggered, they're just uh, about every 15 seconds or so. Not hardcore or anything, but you know, some distance between the words. And that's what I'm going to read you. Uh, there's a bank of lights that go on just once and kill all the images, basically. I mean, you don't see anything anymore. But you do see a kind of after image of the structure of the insides of the place. And in this case, there, there were windows. You know, they've been blacked up, but you, they left the architecture. And also a number of columns, and et cetera, et cetera. So your, your mind's eye, or your actual eye, fills up with an intense architectural um, memory. And then the image slowly comes back. And then by the time it sort of is there, it's hit with another uh, hit of light with the next word. And you kind of construct these words then through memory and the memory also of your eye mixed with the kind of almost like an osmosis of San Francisco leading into this space for the last time. So, the storytelling room. This was actually something like what I wanted to do here, I told Tommy, but he couldn't make it dark enough. Because it has to be really dark. So, clear your minds. So. There, apart, and yet from, A swarm of particulars gathering appearances between slippages, moments drawing near. making up for lost time. A disturbing act. I thought, imagining another moving. Across the room in cold silence. I kept reading and I kept from reading the words, each one. one after another becoming a single word, perhaps, perhaps, the story may have begun decidedly 
under the influence of an image, lodged in a shadow worthy of darkness. I remember the face, a perfect decoy, positioned in space, as if separated from its body, brittle with certainty, the dryness of the eyes. so unbearably dry. I watched Tumbleweed blow through the two empty cinemas, turning away, eliminated the chance of questions. In return, I didn't expect a single utterance. Somehow, the whole rigmarole of this space, its way with the world, registering that it all had to take place in time. Okay, so I'll do a little short one now. And then maybe... uh, this is a, a tiny little particle that was used in a, a dance performance. Meg Stewart and Damaged Goods called Splayed Mind Out. I don't even remember how, but anyway, or what was happening. It was live though, I mean, it was, it was, it was just like now. The smell of the tall trees that brings us to our senses. A field of shimmery mirages evokes memories of movies in one smeared green of your own. Abruptly, eyes about face, taking in the black, velvety curtain beyond which there are no cities, cities with adequate light to reflect back the ceiling for the sky. You stand there like a giant walking stick, ready to infiltrate invisible forests. A second thought reclines you without a fight. Your knees become headlights deep in the night, illuminating my being with the blindness of light. I hit the ground. I wait for the earth to quake. Starfish hands suck a grip from tiny crushed rocks. There I am, eye level with a dead rodent, annihilated by invention singled out by the giant movements of coincidence, its body made abstract, unrecognizable save for the eyes, glazed over with the last shudder of life. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little duet with my very own daughter. Or we're gonna try, anyway. Share. <laughs> yes, wait, let me see where it is. I'm, I'm going to probably screw up, so not her. So it's his <laughs> <laughs> um, So this is uh, from a word called House of Cards. And uh, Say something. Uh, something. Um, well, actually, uh, all the images 
for it's an installation, and there's a kind of ladder structure with mon uh, vertical monitors, and there's an image that basically looks like continuation through these spaces, right? And these were recorded with a motorized camera. Think of like an orange peel type movement through a house, every room and every space kind of all the walls have been recorded like that, like 360 degrees all the way around again and again and again. And then these have been sort of connected together by wiping so it looks like it's continuous. And then there are two uh, vertical monitors on the outside of two people doing what we're going to do. And, uh, but they were recorded live doing this. And I had this sort of sort of fulcrum device that was maybe 20 feet long. Uh, and they were sitting, you know, I don't know, like a little closer than this. And so the cameras are looking at their faces um, identically the same. So it's all kind of close up, about like this, say, something like this. And so as I, I'm moving the, this device, it's moving the cameras simultaneously, so they're always doing the same part of the face at the same time. So just so you kind of have an idea. It really won't really matter so much. Are you ready? <clears throat> hold it here, hold it there. Have one hand here, hand over hand, mouth over eyes, head over heels, back to back, wall to ceiling, floored by the sight, thoughts doubling as other thoughts, things inhabiting the room, rooms doubling as other rooms, doors without sound, I am talking to you, face lost in my hands, hands rifling papers, walls mined with displays, pictures of those framed moments, flesh and fool's blood, time stolen by consumption, of others agony, agony safely distanced from terror, terror stapled to a mouth with words, words hollowed out, out of rain falling twice, twice comes once, once in a lifetime time to return, return a glance from a face gone, gone to mirror all is mind crossed out, out of a meaning and its place, place that bodies call here, here is what stands alongside the one, one is not allowed here, here are my Promises, promises you keep, within reason, reason for breaking, and entering, entering the house, house with the name, home of known quantity, quantity of questions of from the back, back to the bed of surrender, surrender of thought to word, word penetrated by sound, sound of dropping clothing, clothing folded without incident, incident erased from origins, origins of stories kept and bound as ruptured volumes, read between scribbled bodies, holding bodies gone, gone from the point of going, going back to square one. one is not allowed here, here are my promises, promises, promises you can't keep talking around and about, about the instance, insistence of talking. talking between you and I, I am listening, listening the wrong way, out where you don't want to go. go before the left eye, eye of our word, word hollowed out, out of rain falling twice place. comes once, once in a life time to return, return a glance, glance from a face a Gone, to tell all, all is not lost, lost inside your words. words are all we have, have we to speak, to speak? see how they run, run from your mouth, mouth to mouth, mouth swims upside up. down seeing red, red from talking, talking for you and I, I am listening, listening the wrong way, way out where you don't have words collapse thought, thought holding forth that which you cannot seeing see. was not 
was once believing in the touch of your mouth, mouth to mouth, mouth of a moth eating light from a naked bulb that sways the tortured faces people. on heads protruding from necks, necks circled by stones, stones trespassing time, time encircling zero. zeros request one, one for now, now and forever more distant distances distances we imagine, imagine between what, what Ever counts differences that make difference of standing positions of forgiveness versus rights, rights claimed as older than origin, origin of no return. return a point larger than mine. Mind is as close as you come, come as you are with or, or without, without knowing which is the hand that reaches out, out of bounds from questions, questions lost in points, points on hold. hold it here or there. There is where others have, have one. And here, here goes the other hand, hand over, hand, hand over mouth, mouth over eyes, eyes over angels from day one. one is not allowed here, here and now over and again and I begin from the back. back to the voice that houses sounds, sounds of plants making, making believe, believe it or not, not in the least of all truth, truth as it may have been being, being and time gone awry Rye from thought put on hold. Okay, so uh, I don't know. What are we doing on time here? Uh, it's getting pretty hot there. Okay, so I'll, I'm just going to read one more because it's kind of. What time is it? Oh, it is. Okay. All right, so that's really late. So I just want to read the most recent thing. Yes, you know, artists have to do that sort of thing. You know, uh, pretty much sounds like all the other. <laughs> <laughs> Especially certain parts. I tend to borrow from myself anyway. So. <laughs> Seriously. I'm closer to grasping what is exactly happening. I limit myself to rummaging through piles of surplus, boxed accoutrements, and that unaccounted for miscellanea. A trough of slow time inverts my relationship with those said things in rather insidious ways. I only ruminate on certain ones that appear and disappear for no apparent reason, except that at one time or another, I assume them. It's come to the point where carrying out the simple task of doing one thing after another only happens with great difficulty. Thoughts are incapable of holding words, that they remain steadfast long enough to cure, that I might follow my own instruction set. Not that there aren't words in any sense of the word, it's just their way of pressing up against me of not wanting to tango, as it were. They are decidedly uncooperative, making the liquidity of thought next to non-existent. The playful specters slip free of my desire and proceed to taunt me. An inability to differentiate one from another has me closing my eyes, humming to myself, hoping to resonate with my own bones. For an instant, I envision each word wearing a Venetian mask. Together, they mischievously switch their cloaks just behind the lid of thinking. The moment I begin to verbalize, pictures of the very words I try to fit my mouth around morph into Bolian lookalikes, and my utterance turns to garbled nonsense. I have the distinct sense of being backwards. Thoughts are eating themselves before any kind of linguistic traction takes place. Periodically, I'm awakened from my little still point by disturbances on the outside. A Doppler shift of a distant siren, a perturbed neighbor, a whimpering dog. Whatever the night offers gives me much needed movement, however brief. 
Am I capable of living language without dread? Bursts of physicality momentarily tear me from the crippling loops of recursive meanderings, giving me a modicum of hope. But they never fail. The naked words, the micro nightmares, scurry back to their respective husks before resuming the mind, the mind game the house always wins. A chill air stirs the verbal cocoon, lifting a recurring memory from unknown depths, casting its script upon the procession of thoughts. Memories exercised are suspect. Did it happen? What difference does it make? There is an attraction to each mind's singular way of constructing such things. A vast network of crisscrossing runways, many fold resemble close-ups of globe-like globe -like balls made from accumulated rubber bands varying in size. I had difficulty determining distance from what appeared to be an engineering feat of unimaginable proportions. A glorious evening sky added to the celebration of human ingenuity that lay before me. Giddy abandonment was palpable as the ultramarine splendor found its cradle in the depth of waiting blackness. The velvety canopy transformed visibility into an infinite space of vertiginous possibilities. As night sparkled, my focal point began shifting from one extreme to the other, scrutinizing the view more thoroughly. Giving the aura of calmness, why was there not a single plane taking flight? landing or taxi. Instead, a menagerie of aerodynamic beauties passively stood looking like arrowheads, randomly pointing in all directions. Service vehicles and miscellaneous support machinery, machinery were also idle and silent. What made the situation all the more strange was the absolute stillness of the air itself, and yet it wasn't stale in, every, in any sense. It was strangely odorless and innocent, and intoxicatingly so. I found myself taking deep breaths, each one deeper than the last, as if supplementary oxygen had been pumped into my whereabouts. By now, the clarity of the night could only be described as magnificent. The abundance of stars looked more like scattered sand or bits of crystal perfectly attuned to that one unseen oscillator that sings at a fever pitch. Everything was perfectly still and exquisitely placed as if by a giant hand. Perhaps it was a secret project, which for whatever reason had to be abandoned. But this explanation fell too as cluttered debris, heaps of scrap and broken glass were all absent. On the contrary, the place looked immaculate and strangely calculated. Was it camouflaging? a simulacrum of something perhaps sinister, even more fantastic, a stealth sight of some kind, a place made invisible by proprietary algorithms that I had inadvertently broken the code of. The thought was frightening and queerly exhilarating. Already the adrenaline was cursing my veins. The atmosphere changed dramatically. I could feel a kind of acceleration taking place. I watched my own eyesight rapidly destabilize. Every aspect of my vision was being tested. What moments ago was virtually akin to a still photograph, however mysterious, was revealing itself as a bizarre construction with elaborate riggings, control mechanisms, and massive decoys. I was beginning to perspire and feel ill. I could no longer triangulate the two images that were now flying directly into my pupils. Waves of light moved over the scene like fast-moving clouds. Things were transforming back and forth between opaque physical, physical entities and layers of diaphanous light. My depth of field wasn't helping matters. Occluding one object from another was increasingly difficult. Perception was being absorbed. My vision was that of a tired body being swallowed by quicksand. Had I simply lost consciousness and awakened with a bird's eye view of a cinematic event? Per perhaps I was only peering into an optical contraption, a prototype of some, some kind, swimming in seductive illusionary space, having forgotten it was pressed up against my face. Or had I embarked on a 
somatic ballistic journey that night. I live on the outskirts of a desert border town, a place of quietude, conducive to a sleepwalk of any length, length that, could, that would have me nowhere in no time at all. Somehow I needed to make physical contact to confirm or deny the circumstances before me. There was the nagging thought that it, that it was my very own existence that would be determined once I decided we made the move, whatever that might entail. Admittedly, I lacked the necessary resolve to push the knot out of what was beginning to feel like a wooden void. Everything seemed to be aligning itself within, if, if with nothing else. Was it simply a question of synchronicity? Synchronicity. And that's it. <laughs> Decaying sites. So I think we have some time for Q and A. Oh, Q and A. If people are still up for it, um, maybe like five, ten minutes. I ask the same questions, you get the same answers. No. <laughs> You could ask us some questions if you want to reverse the process. <laughs> sure, who are you? <laughs> Samuel Beckett. Samuel, Samuel Beckett? Samuel Beckett. Uh-huh. No, I'm Philip Walston. Philip Walston. Oh, this is your place. <coughs> no, this is Tommy's place. Uh, no, but you work here. <laughs> <laughs> that you name sounds I, you familiar. You and I were born together at uh, 911 in the 80s. From way back. Uh huh. When we were, Jill was there. Okay, yeah, I remember 911. Oh, she was and or. It was 911 Oh, okay. So, I guess I was here before you even. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a question? Yeah, so as you re reread these now, you know, can't pick out from the file cabinet. Do you ever think about maybe redoing it or revisiting them or with, with a different. Uh, uh, actually, I, I consider this actually just somewhat that. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I read them differently as as I feel now. I'm not just sort of archivally reading them right. as they were read. Right. Um, and but I've I've done performances with these. At, I mean, different some of them, uh, and uh, you know, redone them that were not perform. You know, they they're not. Originally, they were not done as performances, but they were kind of recorded performances. So I, I do, yes, I, I, I do things with them <laughs> every now and then when I'm at a loss for something else. <laughs> uh, but, you know, actually, the, 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 even the idea of, or the question of the archive is very interesting to me, particularly now, <laughs> as I'm... Uh, you know, trying to, or you start to think about that, especially with, when you, you know, talk about hard drives or mirroring hard drives or, uh, you know, whatever you back up or if you want the information, why do you want it? Why wouldn't you want it? Should you want it? Does somebody else want it so you take care of it? Or, I mean, it's, it's quite infinite, actually, once you get into the archive or what, what that means, you know. And in fact, quite recently, um, uh, a writer, Gabriel, I can't, Guernico, I can't really pronounce his last name. He's an Italian guy, and he's he's he's, a, he's doing a a project with different artists, and uh, it's uh, his general theme was, uh, you know, what happens after death. And, you know, for me, the, this question of the archives came up. So I'm doing a project <laughs> about archiving. That's kind of life after death, right? You know? And uh, I, had, I have some, actually, images that I used in a uh, performance of, of Edgar Varez, complete works of Edgar Varez, and I did the dramaturgy and images and stuff. And, and one of them involved uh, close-ups with you know strange angles of light 
on vinyl records. And uh, there's you know incredible things that are happening. Um, so anyway, I'm, now I'm really kind of into this kind of decoding the light and the grooves of records in some way. And, and, I, and I, I think this is, I don't believe this, but it, it is a, it's a conspiracy theory <laughs> that there are people out there that can look at a record and tell you what it is. You know? I find that hard to believe, but anyway, I find it fascinating nevertheless. Um, so, and one of the things I'm presenting to him is the idea of recording the making of a vinyl record as it's, you know, the, the record itself is the, make, is, is the sound of it making it. You know, like so, the machine and the groove, the whatever it does is doing it. It's you know making itself uh, as part of this concept. Anyway, anyway, archives, you know, <laughs> the past, and whatever, into the future. Yeah. So, how about um, current practices or issues in surveillance and I guess personal security or informed your practice? I understand that you're greatly enamored with the analog, but what about the digital, and I guess, how, do that, how does that play out in your practice? Well, it gives you the idea, I'm, I'm greatly enamored by the analog. <laughs> <laughs> I take that. I mean, I'm analog right now, anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, coincidentally, I have some works up at uh, James Harris Gallery that are kind of align with your question. They're all kind of, I mean, I don't really think of them as surveillance is just not a word that is nuanced enough for me. <laughs> this is kind of on or off. Uh, uh, but there's works there that are all um, real-time, you know, closed circuit, I guess, of, of uh, you know, what that means in different ways. So, and, um, you know, I guess they're kind of analog, kind of digital or <laughs> something. I don't really think about it, but I, I use what, what makes sense at the time. You know? um, yeah, I'm not, I guess I'm not really sure of your question. I guess, um, or could you just talk about the works that you do have at James Harris Gallery? Oh. Just about, I guess, the conceptual process. And yeah, okay, well, what the, the, the first work that you walk into is it's, it's called Dream Stop, and it's uh, the work was initially derived from uh, a dream catcher, and uh, but in the development of it, I mean, it doesn't really look like a dream catcher. There's no yarn or <laughs> beads or what have you. Uh, it's probably even closer to just kind of an Islamic pattern. But anyway, let's just say it's somewhere between. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's just it's it's just like kind of you know, a, a meditative, design, decorative thing, but it's full of cameras, 31 of them, that you can't really, you can't see, that you wouldn't think about that even. And uh, so you're, when you walk in and say, if you're looking at this, then your, your image uh, saturates the space with 31 projections, you know, that range yeah, and, and they're they're random. They're kind of they could be upside down, right side up, angle doesn't really matter. It's just the fact that they're uh, all encompassing and everywhere. Um, and you know, there's not really much more to say about it. It's like you know, it's pretty kind of that's what it is. Um, yeah, another work there is called um, I'm not even really sure of the exact title. It's uh, self with parentheses, empty parentheses. It's referring to a series of self works. There's self A, B, C, D, and F, and there's no self E. And you know that's just part part, part of it. You know, if if one gets that, it's fine. But if not, no big deal. And all the images or all the works involve you know, looking, you know, into a, you know, a looking pipe, you're, you know, you're drawn to it because it's like a viewfinder of some kind, 
and you see parts of yourself just you know kind of unexpectedly and you don't even really know at first whether they're you or is it now is how is this happening etc cetera, etc cetera. so and they, they kind of look like medical equipment you know, it's kind of this association so um, they're kind of innocent but kind of insidious and um, showing this other part and then in the back room uh, the there's one work called uh, Painting with Two Balls after Jasper Johns and it's a direct obviously refers to this in fact it looks like that opening in the Jasper Johns painting and uh, in this case well I was trying to kind of work off the idea of doing you know painting and I thought why not choose an abstract expressionist to start from? <laughs> so anyway, the two balls in this case are, they have little tiny cameras in them, and you then are um, uh, smeared across the two canvases uh, simultaneously. Anyway, and then the other works are kind of derived from that and variations on a theme. Um, and yeah, there's no words. No words. <laughs> that doesn't mean there will never be words. I mean, yeah, every time you know you do that. Oh, I, I understand that you haven't you're not, you, you haven't done any language works in a long time. You know, it's like, well, not exactly, but anyway. It is language. So yeah. Thank you. So. Writing process. When does it come into the piece? When does it take place? Oh, uh, you mean like what came first, the image or the word? Kind of <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Kind of no, uh, it, you know, it's very. It, there's no set methodology. Um, I mean, you know, I can start to write something that you know I, I don't even perceive that it's going to be in a work that is not just writing, although I don't have any of those. <laughs> but, you know, um, but like I said, like for instance, the videograms, when I said that I had this particular, I, I know this machine so well that, you know, there's just, you know, syntax and the way things are said, you know, I, can, I feel like I can work with that or not, or this kind of thing. You know, sometimes, um, like I have something that's really old just sitting on the computer that I haven't worked on in a long time. It's a very complicated thing having to do with just writing. It's called the role of language. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I did... R-O-L-L. Yeah. Um, and um, I think what I did is I went through the whole dictionary and I, and I just cataloged, I guess you could say, I mean I, I listed all the words that I liked. I mean, that means like that I could use in a, in a kind of, in the sense that I use words, you know, like everyone does that specifically, not things I like, it's not like, you know, Cadillac, although I like that word, but you know, Cadillac. Uh, you know, it's this kind of thing, you know, like you, you, you kind of are attracted to certain sounds of words, you know, differently. And so, you know, I, it was a, an extreme process. I don't even remember it. It was like, you know, the first word, it was, you know, a structural thing, like this word, the next word has to have, uh, I, I think actually the first letter of each word then made words vertically or something like this. And it's an incredibly complicated kind of crosswordy, John Cage kind of thing, you know. Uh, so sometimes it's like that, you know, like, um, you know, some <coughs> elaborate, structure that I try to fulfill, you know. Um, but like, say for instance, around and about, the, the one that it could have gone another way, a completely different way, way in there. Huh? Uh, I, had, um, I had just split with a girlfriend, very, you know, tumultuous thing, years and years, and going back and forth, whatever, you know, it's kind of like, and it was in Buffalo, and I had, you know, I had to move into my, to this little office space, and I and I just wrote this text. I mean, it wasn't a letter to her or anything, but you know, I was writing it kind of as a 
dual thing, like kind of to her, but to somebody, the other, you know, there. And, and it was very quick. I just wrote it. And, you know, maybe I changed some of it as I, as I went on. And, you know, it, it was meant to be kind of like that. It wasn't like a, like, I can spend days on a sentence, you know what I mean? Like, if it, you know, this was just written, like, you know, 20 minutes or two hours or whatever it was, you know. Uh, so it, it very different kind of feel, you know. Um, so I don't know, it really, it's really all over the board. You know? Yeah, I mean, you know, this this uh, in the last show I did at Jim's, you know, the piece called Lodia Piorn, these pieces of found glass with made up words. And uh, I'm thinking of showing this in India for the biennial there, and wondering whether I should ask a poet there to, you know, what what would he come up with? <laughs> so, I mean, it just fascinates me, like, so is it totally different? I mean, obviously the language is different, but, you know, I'm, I'm you know, are, are all my fascinations with the sounds grounded in the fact that I speak English, or is it something else? Because, you know, I, I, I do, I did make these words based on, you know, uh, whether they were soft, curvy, you know, sharp, or big or round or column-like or what lots of many different things, you know. So it's just kind of a, a one linguistic you know. space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Linguistic space. Big space. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I just gonna say I really loved uh, <coughs> the piece where you used all of the cliches and entire language and so forth. It's really amazing to me how one can recycle things that have been used a thousand times, but put them in a new site, and suddenly you make them new again. Uh, you know, like Doug Newford once did a thing where he took uh, the titles of songs, uh-huh. pop songs, just stuck them all together in this sure. kind of nonsensical, but somehow, uh, somehow inevitable uh, progress where one led to the other, led to the other, and there was all sorts of things that were evoked that were never sort of intended by the language in its original structural use. But what I was thinking of when I I went through some of those cliches with you is some of them are very, very old to the point where they've been replaced by newer cliches, like the phrase, you know the ropes, which is something that you and I might remember from the 50s or 60s, has been replaced by you know the drill, which you hear in every Coen Brothers movie, and it probably would have been replaced maybe by two other things. Well, yeah, I mean, I would probably use boots on the ground now. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, it's, it's funny because that, that, that space where you limit yourself to a very rich lexicon is really fun. Yeah. I mean, it's really fun because, like you said, you know, there's ideas that emerge that, you know, they, they really get in there. You know, like, right. well, this is happening. This is real. This is not like a badge or just a cliche or... You know, it's funny because I did also think of Matisse's cutouts and how that must work too. Like, you have, he had this kind of, you know, cliché cutouts and he just starts to play with them and then, you know, they kind of fall into place. So you weren't thinking about Dutrell's Whatever of Yours? Because that's what I thought it would be. You know, which had cliché phrases going around and around and around. No, I, I don't, actually, I'm not even familiar with that. I, I did think of, though, uh, the cutouts. Like that, mm-hmm. but, but that's more of a random, you know, like cutting them up and seeing, you know, using the, the cut ups to make connections. You know. It was also a little depressing because it seems like that's almost all a lot of people say. You know, it's, it's all you need, you know, which is kind of really curious. Well, yeah, I mean, so I, much I, I think we're, just I, I think yeah. our speech is getting lazier and lazier yeah. because, well, <laughs> Phones are getting more in our face, and television. I mean, you know, like the humiliation of the word. There's a book called that so, um, by uh, Jacques Lowe, and it's precisely about this, like where you know there's no time for mediation or reflection or dialogue, 
all the space and time of thinking is taken up with images. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming.